Hey, Jeff, because there are paths and there are paths. But I, I, I want to tell you about one path, however. Now, if you are following the way of the flesh, and following the way of the covetous, and following the way of the lustful, and following the way of those who are willing to do whatever they have to do to satisfy what they desire. Well, that's a broad highway, and it will lead to the same place I just got out. <laughs> and very often it does. I, 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 you and I both know this. Not always, but very often. But, but you know, the Lord said that in addition to the high broad way, there was the narrow way. Yes, yes. Now, I've got to tell you, now, the Lord said that that narrow way will lead you to his Father, will lead you to salvation. Yeah. But what, what sometimes we, we miss is that when the Lord said to take up your cross, didn't he say that? Yeah. Take up your cross and follow me. Yeah. He said that, right? Now, here I have a question for you. Where was the Lord going when he was carrying the cross? Yeah. Where was he going? Where was he going? To death. He was going to the place of execution. He was going to suffer the penalty reserved in Rome for the worst kind of criminals. You see? So it looks like the broad highway can lead you to the place of punishment. But so can the narrow road that follows Jesus Christ. Because if you, if you follow what he says and you take up that cross and you follow in his footsteps, the footsteps will go to the Sermon on the Mount and the footsteps will go to the triumph as he entered Jerusalem. But then the footsteps will go to the court of the Pharisees. The footsteps will go to the torture stake of the Romans. The footsteps will go to the cross. And I sometimes think these days, you have folks who want us to uh, act as if that is, that is not the case. They want us to act as if the gospel, the good news, is all about what God will do for us. See? If you do this and thus and such, and you tithe and thus and such, and you pray and thus and such, then the Lord will give you, and the Lord will reward you, and the Lord will lift you up, and the Lord will, will reward you 10,000 times over. And, and they want to make us believe that following in the footsteps of, of Jesus is just, a, is just a broad highway to the gold, and to the silver, and to the praise of men. But, but then every now and again, it's just, I, I sit there and think to myself, but, but do you want to know the truth? No. This is a lie. You know that, right? <laughs> Folks who want to want to preach in some worldly way, the prosperity gospel and the money gospel and the gospel of rich reward, if you will only give them this and take that. Mm -hmm. that, that. That has nothing at all to do with the path of Jesus Christ. No, you, you will find Jesus sitting sometimes at the, at the table of of the of the wealthy publicans and the tax collectors probably probably having a pretty good meal too. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but where he was really sitting, where he was really sitting, was at the workbench of his father God. It looked to us like a feasting table with the wealthy publican, but but it was really the place where the Lord fashioned the work that his father had sent him to do. The work of calling souls. The work of lifting the eyes of men and women to the truth. The truth of God's calling, of his vocation for them. And his vocation for them is it's not all caught up in these things the world thinks so important. It was caught up with a vision of truth. It was caught up with an understanding formed and informed by the word of God. And so when we come to our, our day now, one of the sad things, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say, is that, is that there are so many shepherds, so many shepherds, so many shepherds that, that seem to have forgotten what their job is. I really have to tell you this, there really are. There are shepherds that have forgotten what their job is 
And sometimes I think there, there are even some shepherds who, who uh, fail to forget that, that uh, what Jesus exemplified as the good shepherd has to be seen in, in the context of the original will of his Father God. I have a question for you. When, when God first created Adam and Eve and, and he set things up in the garden and so forth and so on, what was their diet? What did they get to eat? They got to eat fruit. They got to eat vegetables and so forth and so on. Did they eat sheep? No. Did they eat sheep? No. No, they did not. The original well of our Father God did not have sheep on the menu. All right. <laughs> now, now, when the Lord spoke of himself as the good shepherd, was he speaking of himself from the point of view of hungry men or from the point of view of the Creator God? Right. And when he sent someone out to be the shepherd, it's not so they can shear the sheep. It's not so they can cuff them up and prepare them to be eaten for dinner. No, it's not. For the Lord is the good shepherd meant to raise up the sheep and to tend the sheep and to care for the sheep, even as Adam and Eve were directed to care for the things in the garden of God. To show to them the love that God means to show to all of this created world and to all of us created in and, and that is the call of the true shepherd. And, and the true shepherd also understands that he is therefore to see the sheep not with the eyes of human beings, not with the eyes of just us men and women. He is to see the sheep as best he can with the word and through the eyes and with the heart of our almighty God. And that means, does he mistake the, the life of this body and this flesh for the life of his sheep? No, because he knows that Jesus came, and one of the things he came to make clear to us, even as he came here and he took on our form, and the heart that beat in his body was just like yours and mine, and the blood that ran through his bloodstream was just like yours and mine, and when they laid the lash upon his back, he, he felt the pain just as you and I would feel it, just as our fathers and our grandfathers and our great-grandfathers did feel it. He understood that pain. He understood that suffering and the blood that ran down his cheeks when they pressed into his brow the crown of thorns. Yes. That yes. blood was blood just like yours and mine. Yes, Lord. Yes. But, but even so, they did everything they could. They tortured his flesh, and they bruised his flesh, and they broke his flesh, and, and, and they flayed him right down to the bone, and then they laid him on the cross and stretched out his limbs until his arms were pulled from the sockets and drove the nails through his hands and lifted him up against the dark sky of Golgotha. Until he died. Until his flesh became as someday this fleshly body of yours and mine Thing that you look upon and there, there is no life, there is no emotion in his God. And he was dead. He had given up his spirit into the hands of his Father God. But, but as Randall was just reminding us, he had already told his disciples that uh, he was going to linger <laughs> in that condition for a couple of three days. And then he was come back. He was going to raise up once again. His father God lifted him. And there he be. The interesting thing, and I was, it's because a friend of mine just called me recently, and, and rather he was talking about the very passage that you were talking about just now with Mary Magdalene. And he pointed something out to me that I had really never thought of about that passage. And uh, because the, uh, the, the Mag Magdalene is depicted, and the women are depicted in that passage, bringing to the tomb uh, things with which you would clean and anoint someone, right? Mm -hmm. But you do recall that when Jesus was taken down from the cross and, and, and so forth, uh, the, the folks who had taken him down, they had done all the things that you do to dead bodies. Right. It had all been done. Yeah. So if they came to the tomb 
And they came with clean clothes. And they came with oil.